everybody, and welcome to the Cinefix Top 100, the cul-de-sac on which we live that may freak out the garbage men a little bit, but we do get to watch 100 of the greatest movies of all time. I'm Clint Gage, and joining me as always, the soda jerk voted most likely to snap and kill her entire family, Alex Stedman. How you doing, Alex? I liked that one a lot. I'm good. How are you, Clint? Good. I'm gr- I don't know if that's going to fit on the lower third. I'm kind of curious to see this we'll edit, see. see if it does or not, but yeah. Uh, and of course, the Great Dane hiding in our basement, Michael Calibro. Cal, what's happening, dude? What's good, man? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. We get to hang out, talk about movies again. Every, there's literally nothing wrong with that whatsoever. No. Um, although, having said that, I do have one critique. I, I do feel like we should have watched last week's movie and this week's movie as a double feature. It should have just been one episode, I feel yeah. like. And oh, maybe that we can sneak been in fun. a. Maybe we can sneak in a double double feature episode somewhere down the line, but I think we can all agree that Dan really blew I was just going to say, do we just want to turn all the Dan picks into double features? I guess, yeah, just so just, we can hustle through them a little quicker. Just like, let's get through the title of this movie so we can get to the the real topic that we need to discuss, which is slumming it with Dan. <laughs> Slumming it with Dan. We're talking about The Burbs this week. Uh, 1989, directed by Joe Dante, starring Tom Hanks, Bruce Stern, Carrie Fisher. It had a Corey, which was a huge deal back in the 80s. You want to to give your movie a Corey if you can, if you're a filmmaker in the 80s. Um, It's a movie that I grew up with. I grew up watching it. It's very funny. And I think it's very, it's skillfully crafted because it's sort of it paints with such a broad brush, but it all still works. Like it, it uses fun stereotypes and, and it actually makes all of them work in, in funny ways. But it's, um, it, but yeah, this is another one that uh, it just, it has the stink of Dan all over it, doesn't it? it oh, it, it reeks. I want to say two things about this because I'm. We'll have, to, I'm, we'll have to see at the end of, the, end of this episode where it actually ranked and yeah. who voted for it. But uh, well, the fact that this is a not. This is not a not 100, which means that this is a on the list. Oh, so like I think guess. about our not 100s, like yeah. that we said this is better than. Yeah. So like there's we we've done episodes on Midnight Cowboy. We've done episodes on subtract, The Fly. Yeah. We've done episodes on Jack, Jackie Brown in Bruges. All of those movies to Dan fucking algorithm lower than the burbs now the the burbs that like listen i'm not going to sit here and tell you that i did not enjoy watching this movie this is like peak 1994 tbs like if i'm scrolling through the channels in the mid 90s and like the burbs is on i'm done i'm gonna watch i'm gonna watch the rest of this is this a top 100 movie of all time well hang hang on hang on that's what we're here to talk about so like don't don't skip to the end I'm not skipping to the end, but like, I mean, let's be real here. This is the episode. It, it's on the list somewhere. The question is where. We'll save that to the end. But at the same point, hey, it's on the list. Listen, we all have our The Burbs. I have my feelings about this movie, but we all have our listen, The Burbs. We, we all, Favorite versus we best. All, we all slummed it with Dan, all right? I was there on Robin Hood. Clint was there on uh, Three, uh, three Amigos. Amigos. Yeah. yeah, I was with him on Seven Samurai. Alex Innocent, you know. That's so. no, honestly, <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, if least. you gotta if you gotta slum it with Dan somewhere, Seven yeah. Samurai is probably the right way to do it. But I mean, like, congratulations for pulling Dan out of the gutter for like one episode. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a. I, I'll laugh. I don't if it's know that this one is in the gutter though. Yeah. Like this this movie, I I wouldn't qualify this movie as a movie that belongs in any gutters. You know. Like subtract the total 100 from the total amount of movies that have ever been made. And there's going to be a lot of really good movies that we don't get to talk about on this show. Um, peak, this peak, is not me defending Dan. Peak TBS Just right let here. Me clear that up. Peak TBS. Yes. Yeah. No, I, this is, this is superstation fodder. Like you Ted, wouldn't believe. And that's Ted probably Turner why. made so much money syndicating this film in the last like 30 years. Yeah. And we, we talked probably. about this before the episode. It's impossible to stream anywhere. Like you cannot find it yeah. online. Like, it's tough to find. I mean, it's yeah. a universal movie, but there's got it's got to be some co-producer, co-production finance with some other company that the rights went somewhere else. And like the fact that it's not on at least like I feel like Netflix catches movies like this, right? Like just like the catch-all of like I don't think anybody technically owns this movie, so it's on Netflix. Like that, that it feels like the Burbs ought to be there because Cal, like you said, the this is peak tbs like this is superstation all the way 101 like yeah which is probably where i learned to love this movie when i was a kid um like i'm sure that that's where i saw it for the first time and i'm sure there are jokes that i didn't get until i saw an actual version of it instead of the edited for tv version or, or whatever but it's um but either way the burbs i mean i like 
the pedigree of this movie is not bad, ah, right? Joe Dante, awesome. Joe Dante is great. He had some legit bangers in the eighties. I think this among them, like the Howling, uh, Gremlins. It, do you guys like Inner Space? I've never. Seen I don't want to turn this into an Inner Space episode, well, but Inner Space is, is one of those in Inner Space too. Because yeah. I was like seeing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but um, I, I like a lot of Joe small, Dante. I, I know Tayo's a big Small Soldiers guy. He was talking about that earlier. Like that's. I was small trying soldiers. to think of yep. who's a yeah. Small Soldiers guy. That is Tayo. Yeah. yeah, I mean anything with Henry movie. Gibson in it is is a lot of fun. Henry uh, Gibson I, I, is in Inner Space as the he he plays Martin Short's boss at a um, oh, uh, at the grocery store, and it's. It's Amazing. it's wonderful. It's great. Inter, inner space is. I don't want to turn this into an inner space movie, but inner space didn't end up on my list. I'll I'll, I'll do that amount of spoilers. But um, point the point is, uh, I'm I'm in the bag for Joe Dante. Like he's he's a lot of fun, and he did some incredible work in in the '80s. He even did a few episodes of um, the Police Squad, the he the TV po- series that was a precursor precursor to uh, to Naked Gun. What he did a couple episodes of that. What ones did he do? Do you know offhand? I, I don't know which ones. I was just looking at his IMDb, but he's he's got Dude, a couple of those credits. I, I was I, surprised to see. So. I can't wait till we and get some to Twilight Zone stuff. I can't wait till we get to the Naked Gun episode. I I I'm have I'm confident that that's on the list because it is very high on mine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If right. Independence Day can get on the list, yeah. then so can uh, uh, so can Naked Gun. Um. So Joe Dante is I I this is peak. Joe Dante, I mean, we're in the we're in the range of peak Joe Dante for sure. I do. Is, I think is this, this is the entirety 89? of the eighties. Yeah, it's 89. 89. 89. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is like what um, right after this is right before Gremlins too. Uh, right before Gremlins also. Yeah. Oh, it's um, right before Gremlins. Yeah. Who Gremlins? Right before oh, Gremlins okay. too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Gremlins was eighty four, yeah. which is my Joe so, Dante uh, of choice. Mine too. Right. Yeah. So he did uh, the Howling in eighty one. Um, Gremlins in 84, Inner Space 87, The Burbs in 89. And that skips over a couple episodes of Amazing Stories, The Twilight Zone. Um, Those 80s Twilight Zones were interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all that 80s, because even Amazing Stories too, like all those fun little anthologies that that New Hollywood was trying to put together in the in the 80s was they, they were all they were all fine. I think. I mean, they're not the original Twilight Zone, which no, by the way, no, not even a little bit. Yeah, um, I spent my New Year's Day doing the right thing, which was watching classic Twilight. The Zone original episodes. Twilight Zone. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, which I'm happy to know that that's a tradition because I think I'm just gonna I'm gonna glom onto that. I'm gonna start making that. Yeah, how did my that kids start? are old enough now. Uh, We're gonna the, the the Sci-Fi Channel every year. They would just have a marathon of the Twilight Zone on New Year's Day. That's how, like, that's how I was introduced to Twilight Zone. My dad would just sit me down and be like, "Hey, Mike, let's watch, let's watch some TV." And then he just put on, he'd put on the Sci-Fi Channel, and then we would just watch the Twilight Zone. And then my dad would just try and quiz me on how I think the episodes are gonna end. And he'd be like, "How do you think this one's gonna end?" I'm like, "Oh, they're gonna try and eat the people." And he's like, "Oh, how, how'd you know that?" I'm like, "The Simpsons did it." Like, my dad got so mad because the Simpsons ruined so many Twilight Zone twists for me, that for him that he couldn't, he couldn't get me. And that's funny. That's how I learned to love the Twilight. I, I think I do want to set a, a new rule for this show that if we ever tell a story about things that our dads told us, we have to do an impression of our dad. Yeah. Um, Cause that was, that was the best part of that story. That is also how I would um, impersonate your dad having never met him. Yeah. Like that's how I would. Or, hey, Mike, yeah. come here. Come, come, on. Here. Sit down. come on. Okay. So getting back to the other obvious uh, heavy hitter in this movie is Tom Hanks. This is um, right after big, isn't it? Tom Hanks, it is immediately uh, after Big, I believe. Like right because, after, I think. Well, and I, I think, too, that um, he, at some point, Ray was going to die at the end of this movie. And yeah. because of Tom Hanks' burgeoning star power, thanks to Big, they were like, nope, not happening. Like, he can't, he can't die. They um, play it up for dramatic effect toward the end. Like, I mean, the I kinda house wish explodes with him in it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's very easy to yeah. to do that version of the of the movie where he where he does die. Um, like, I don't know that this is peak. Peak Tom Hanks no. in terms no. peak of Tom Hanks is is for this, this right? is a, a, Philadelphia. we're immediate well i mean his run of of best actor i mean between philadelphia and forrest gump and yeah. you know which is the, i think the, the er, early that, 
early to mid nineties yeah. is, is probably peak Tom Hanks in terms of just like the quality of the work. I think, I think the eighties mid to late eighties is my favorite Tom when, Hanks. When was, cause this is big. It's the burbs. It's sleepless in Seattle was early nineties. I think Yeah. It's, Turner and Hooch came oh, out later, Turner. later oh. in 89. Oh. Um, the money pit was 86. Like that's, hey, that's our, that kill splash yeah. was in the eighties. I mean, that's, that's my Tom Hanks. If, Shall I'm, it, if I'm being honest, Diane chambers left cheers to pursue a movie career that never materialized because of the money. Wait, pit. It wasn't the money pits fault. The money pit was no, great. Money pit was great, but oh man, I do Shelly long as Diane chambers is one of my favorite TV characters of all time. I, but I, I do think that Tom Hanks in this movie though, is like, he's, he's just, he's such an everyman. Yeah. That, and this is, again, we talked about this last week with rear window. Like it's, you know, as, as much as Jeff sucked in rear, rear window, like Ray's not much better. I mean, uh, but Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks has a, has a sort of softened edge to him, but the edge is still there. I think in this movie, like he's, he's, he's pissed off. He's not that he's not, he's clearly something is bothering him to his core. Uh, and depending on how you want to read the movie, like, is it just the the repetition of suburban life and he's got to go on vacation because he's about to lose it? And, um, by, by the but way, like there's there's a there's a put upon itness to, to him. You know, he's just kind of mad, uh, but you don't hate him for it. I don't think were staycations a thing in the 80s. I just I assumed want- I was just assuming since it was like the Reagan 80s, like money was flowing, like, you know, there was still like manufacturing jobs in America. So like the middle class was doing okay. Like they wanted to, he didn't go to the lake and it sounded like they had a lake house. Cause you know, that's what people had in the eighties. It's just, that's not my idea of restful. All right. This is restful hanging around the house, just being lazy. And that's what I want to do. I just want to hang around. I thought I read somewhere that like originally it wasn't that he was taking a vacation. It th- it's that he was laid yeah. off. Which so that's, makes there's, way there's more a, sense that's to a, me. That's, that's way darker. Right? What, I think well, the darkest yeah, but, day. So here's, yeah. there's a great, uh, and it's, there's a, I'll, I'll end up talking about this a few times, I guess, but there's a work print version of this, this movie that ended up on one of the Blu-ray releases back 10 years ago or something like that. Is that uh, I think Shout, Shout Factory. Factory. Yep. Yeah. Um, but you can watch the work print version where that is the case, where he's hiding the fact that he had been fired from his wife, from Carrie Fisher. Uh, and that's underneath the whole, the that's whole movie. That's way better to And then me. like that, he, that's, that's he fesses, well, and he fesses up to it at the end. And she's like, yeah, I, I know. Because like, because that's the other thing. Carrie Fisher, by the way, which we haven't talked, that's another part of the pedigree. Like we get, we yeah. get Princess Leia in this, I'm gonna, in this movie. I'm going to say I, underused. Criminally so. Criminally underused. Criminally so. I think, yeah, I, I think you can make that argument. But I, I, the counterpoint to that was like the energy that she had in this movie was was such a great counterpoint to the pure insanity like she's just this eye rolling kind of like i don't think that she was ever like like mad about what was going on like they fought a little bit yeah she yeah yeah like the eye rolling energy like i don't know that it even like blipped her radar (laughs) for the most part like she she's just kind of rolling with like yeah no my husband's a child it is what it is well Um, that my thing is i wish and i and i thought that was that was fun yeah yeah yeah. Like she's so funny. Let her be funnier. Let her have a little bit yeah. more person. Like you can still be eye rolly and, and also have, 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 have yeah. exactly have some zingers. Right. Like that's what I'm saying. Um, yeah. But she's still great. But yeah, yeah. Let her be funnier. I don't think she takes away anything. But again, no, no. I don't think she adds. And I don't think that this is such a like an inherently Carrie Fisher role that like anybody else could have filled it. Which is sad because Carrie Fisher can deliver those kinds of performances. Why do I get the impression that you're trying to get rid of me? Honestly, right. this is going to be a hot take. Uh, it takes so hot that I might have to pull a tanner and rear window Uh-oh. and retract. I know. Tom Hanks is actually, to me, one of the least impressive people in the cast, like as far as acting wise goes. Really? Uh, to me. Like he does some okay. cool Tom Hanks things. I, I really like exasperated Tom Hanks. Yeah. I feel... Yeah, exasperated and angry yeah. Tom Hanks. Is, I love when he's like crushing the Tom beers. Hanks. Like that's my favorite part yeah. like of, of, of his performance. Just full of like impotent rage, yeah. crushing beer cans. Like yeah. it's, yeah, that's great. But he was like never my favorite person in any scene. Like, I mean, we'll probably get to him, but like Rick Ducumming kind of stole the show for me. Oh, dude, when he just barges in the house and yeah. just starts eating ribs at breakfast. Oh, I, well, listen, let's. Yeah. Let's get. Uh, is there any any more about this this movie's pedigree that we want to get into before we start? Uh, I, I do. Moments? When we get to Harry or Henry Gibson, I want to talk more about him because. Uh, 
Okay. He is. You yeah, want to talk well, about Henry Gibson? I want to talk about Courtney Gaines. <laughs> Courtney Gaines is my man. I'll, I'll I'll talk about. Uh, um, uh, oh, I also his name Bruce um, Stern because how are no, how, uh, how are brother, we? <laughs> we, yep. we haven't mentioned Bruce Stern yet, but if we're going to talk about the trio of Klopex, I'll handle Brother Theodore. Okay, uh, excellent. Uh, yeah. yeah, so we, we'll we'll get to them eventually. Is this whole thing going to just descend into how much we like all of these actors, but not particularly? This yeah, movie? yeah, no, it's, I it's think a great I, cast. I'm, like, I'm getting a I'm getting a <laughs> sum is less than the 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 or whole is less than the sum of, of its parts, parts kind yeah, of vibe yeah. from this. Yeah. Please, Carol, let him come out. Come on. He can't come out until he resembles the man that I married. Carol, we don't have Carol, that kind of time. Please let him come out. Come on. Okay, well, let's get into brilliant moments then. Um, and I think that we ought to start uh, just right up top. Can we start with the intro and the, uh, the, 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 the Google Earth before Google Earth Zoom that they the, needed, that's, to, that was they the needed f- to commission a miniature set of the, of the cul-de-sac in order to pull that shot off? For what purpose? just to flex like how much did it that- is a it is a flex for sure i'm also very okay so i was i was talking to cal a little bit i'm very confused as to where this film is supposed to be located because it anywhere right smack USA. in the middle of america yeah, like apparently anywhere per, USA. per I, the zoom in on north america it seems like it's you know ohio or do you something. know what you know what else joe dante did in this too it's like when they do the um so like after the opening credits like the next morning after you see the weird shit happen in the basement at night they do like the crane shots in the um in uh in the neighborhood to like opening credits and then it does like the one crane up and it shows like the street like the like the street which is very 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 similar to the shot in the twilight zone where the monsters are the monsters are out on mulberry street so it's like evoking that like suburban nature like that suburban imagery and like iconography in a very like visceral way but we're watching this right now like look this is all miniatures that is kind of wild for no i mean they they look great they look amazing i mean i i think the the idea, you know, it, it's it's a thread that you can pull on if you want to, you know, like that's the thing about this shot is like it, because for me, like if I'm sitting here watching this, thinking like, well, why they do it, and then I'm I'm kind of having to take a walk to get to the the idea of why they did it, which it feels, it makes everything sort of feel a little a little alien, like we're coming at this place, you know, we're coming at this this suburb as like a a weird alien planet it's kind of the the vibe that it gave that it gave me just to correct myself quickly it's the twilight zone episode i'm speaking of here the monsters are due on maple street so the street sign shot is maple street got it yeah i think i maybe went too philosophical with it i think like to me it was very like your story is so small in a big world and if you walk down the street everyone is having these little stories you know i don't know if that's too philosophical it might be but also it's just a a weird cool flex yeah i mean there's those there's room for those in movies too of just like you know i can imagine them sitting around thinking like you know what would be cool to start this movie like the there's a universal logo and let's just zoom all the way into the house that's a hundred from the universal logo. that's a hundred yeah. like that's that's <laughs> that gotta too. be where it is and like we're trying to give it so much credit but i mean you know that's a that's a oh, good I'm, choice honestly i'm not if trying it, to give it, it any it, credit i just think it's a weird <laughs> flex that doesn't in any in any way thematically like push the narrative forward i like that we have every end of the spectrum i'm giving it way too much credit <laughs> you're giving it nothing yeah uh, no i think it's a, I, think, it I think it's yeah. a, i think it's an absolutely cool yeah. shot that does nothing thematically to push the to push the narrative forward i think it's just purely aesthetically cool and they're just like fuck it that's all it needs to be i will say it does a good job of kind of like not no pun intended covering the universality of like picturing your neighbors and what they're doing and trying to tell stories like I, sure. who among us hasn't looked at our neighbor like i had neighbors growing up who never left their houses and we all like assumed certain things yeah. like it was like the same that's, thing that's my dad <laughs> that's your dad <laughs> he's the clopex your dad's a clopex <laughs> that's awesome the, I, but i do think the rest of the sequence though like it does a couple of very cool things which i i think it like it you know, and we did, we talked about the same thing again, this is why it should have been a double feature with rear window. Like it, they did a couple of similar things there where that opening shot establishes a handful of things where like, number one, creepy stuff is happening on the one house that looks different on this block. Like all- that's some suburban stuff too. And, and like, we've already talked about, like everybody has that house on their block of the block that they grew up on or, or whatever of just like, 
you know, here's uh, if, if you are at all suburban or just in a neighborhood of any kind, like there's the one house that's weird. And here we meet it right off the bat. Um, we see Rumsfeld smoking in the window, keeping an eye on things, too. So now we know that everybody's sort of surreptitiously watching everybody else. Also, how how serendipitous is it that like the the like the war hawk is uh, named Rumsfeld? Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, that's it's so ahead of its time. Yeah. Um, uh, but then my my other favorite part about this the sequence is the wind kicking up. Uh, just as he takes one step onto the lawn, like first of all, we like he we look down, we see his toes kind of wiggle. Like, should I take a step over there? And then he takes a step over there, and then this like we, eerie wind pops up out of nowhere. Which is number one, like what the hell, how? Uh, but two, like it establishes the idea that this movie is going to essentially just not give a shit. Like it's not going to follow any rules. Like whatever is funny at the time, like we're going to do it. Doesn't have to be logical. Doesn't have to be grounded in reality at all. Uh, it's just not going to give a shit about that. Like we're going to do funny. We're going to do stuff that's weird and funny. Yeah. And that like it's such a it's such a bizarre little moment right out of the gates um, that it you know, it establishes a lot of important things for, for the rest of the movie. I also, I also like that what they do here in a lot of these shots, right? It's all about establishing the <laughs> spatial relationship of the cul-de-sac. So like where each, like who each of the neighbors are and where their houses are in relation to each other and in relation to the, um, to the, to the weird family's house. What are they? What are they? Clopics. Clopics yeah. Right? The Clopex. Yeah. Except for the cop at the end calls them the Clopics, which, which I was like, why did you, great. Dude, that has to be a choice. It's so Slavic? it's so no. def <laughs> definitively <laughs> different. <laughs> it's so different than the way everybody else has been pronouncing it the entire movie. Like that had to have been a choice. Yeah. Oh yeah. I will anyway. say the beginning makes it see. So my thing throughout the movie is I when I was it's described as like a comedy horror kind of thing, and it starts yeah. so much as more of like a ghost story, and it has moments where it flirts with like the ghost story part of it, and then I don't think it goes hard enough on it, but. Yeah, know. there because there is something supernatural about about yeah, it's very this super opening sequence. Yeah. yeah, it's a little spooky. But I, you know, we go straight from here to the the bright, shiny in the daytime, lots of color paper boy on his route. And but like the other thing that I think sets up the the comedy in this movie really well, right up uh, up front here, is him throwing coffee at the paper boy. Yeah, like <laughs> that part did make me laugh. So <laughs> it's so funny. Um. You know, and apparently, like Joe Dante was was pretty laid back in terms of uh, his his style. So there's a fair amount of improv that that went on, and and so like, I you, you like to think that uh, the idea that this paper boy just zings a paper right at Tom Hanks, and Tom Hanks throws his coffee at him in retaliation, like that that, that was that wasn't in the script. Like I want to believe that that was improv, and that was well, all Tom Hanks being kind of like. Like in, I'm about to break mentally, and now I'm on a. He's a vacation. really going through it, isn't he? In, but he's God. yeah. It's, just, it's so funny. He's so mad. He's in, so mad. <laughs> interesting point about all this. This movie actually started production on the day the writer strike started in 1980. Well, and I think I think that where a lot of my problems come with it is it. I feel like it flirts with things that it should have gone deeper on, and I think the reason it doesn't is because they couldn't do any yeah. more writing. Yeah. Than they were so on set. Yeah. there's a lot of improv on this because they had to improv their way out of some stuff because the writer couldn't work on the script while they were shooting. Apparently Joe Dante actually hired the writer, the writer, Dana Olson was his name. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, uh, he has he, a cameo in, in here. Yeah. He, cause be, specifically because Joe Dante hired him as an actor to be around and then they shot it sequentially specifically because of this, because they couldn't like rearrange or, or reorganize. So they shot it sequentially so they could tweak as they went um, to kind of make sure that the story is fleshed out as and they went through it. production <laughs> and the writer was there like you know as an actor um i don't i don't you know who knows if that story is is completely true or not because theoretically i don't know that might get him in trouble with the union but <laughs> who, who knows it was 89 it's a different time <laughs> um either way though like that that was yeah i mean the him chucking his coffee at the at the paper boy right out of the it's such a funny specific angry character beat for our protagonist to be doing like right up top oh yeah it's so unnecessary too it's like bro just brush it off throwing coffee on a kid no, it might be hot or something the coffee well, but i mean that little shit. you would you, also you throw coffee it, on him yeah yeah 
Because he didn't yeah, like, no, he, he threw just, it in his general direction. It was a little like, aggressive. He was, he was trying to hit him, I think. Yeah, yeah but like, I, I think the kid deserved look, look, it. Look, 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 he's already out of frame. He's, like, <laughs> he's, like, he's peacing out. I don't know. I respect it. It's so funny. But also, like, I mean, you know, it's it's the idea of, because uh, I, I did read a, a, a quote from Tom Hanks about how he was working with uh, this character and how he wanted to, He's going through it and we're not actually going to talk about it on screen, but like he did his homework and he had a base from which he was working about everything that was happening off screen for Ray. And so like the idea that maybe it's a, a, a whole thing about the repetitive nature of, you know, having a nine to five in the suburbs um, and mowing your lawn. What, what is the rant that he goes on at the end? You're going, mowing your lawn for the 800th time. Like he's gone insane because of this life that he lives. And so the fact that a paper boy whizzes one past him and he can't brush it off, he has to react like that establishes something about him, you know? Yeah. No, that's like that's one thing that stuck with me throughout the entire movie is this guy is so like actually there aren't that many scenes, I think, where he cracks a smile. So you think he's technically like in this moment in time, like did they do you think that they changed it where he was on vacation in the editing room? Or no, I don't do you think, think so. like he's shooting this thinking he just got he's hiding I, the fact that he laid he was laid off? I think I mean I think it's hard to tell what because you can watch the work print and some of the stuff some of the scenes are exactly the same. Yeah, uh, there's a couple of scenes that got lifted and there's a couple that are different that they reshot. So it's hard to tell in the movie like what percentage of it is shooting with the backstory of I've been fired. But like you know I, I don't know that that some of that energy is the same though. Like I'm miserable with my life and I just got fired and I'm hiding it from my wife or our sort of next door neighbors, I think, in terms of like, mm -hmm. you know, behaving like a kind of a prick. I do. The other thing I like about this scene that I want to say is the dog pooping in the other yard. Just also just a terrible, mean thing to do, but also just like what yeah. neighbors do to each other. Dude, like, Bruce Darren. Love him. That, that, that's <laughs> like that's, the perfect introduction. Yeah, it is. Too. It is. Yeah. But again, like that's it's another one of these things where this movie paints with such a broad brush. Like that's such a stereotypical neighborhood thing. Like, well, and then one neighbor's dog poops in the other neighbor's yard, and then he gets mad about it. And like it's so there's there's a, this movie plays with a lot of very broad stereotypes. Um, I you know, and it's it's hard to put your finger on exactly why it all it comes together better than I frankly it probably should or deserves to. I mean, I guess you can give Joe Dante all that credit, but between the the army guy and the nosy neighbor and then tom hanks is just a, a catch-all every man in in like the best possible way um this, this is the end this is the end of like like perfect suburban america that's what's so good about this you mean like in movie like in like you, america in, you mean like yeah like, 1989 like, yeah like as a snapshot of like like suburban america right you have like the vietnam vet who's like doing all right you know you have uh Tom Hanks, who looks like a like college educated, like white collar professional. You have the like the old the old man who is retired and just, you know, enjoying retirement. And they all live on this like bucolic, like blissful cul-de-sac where there's no real there's no real problems. Yeah. Like no one has any real problems here, which is the whole point of the movie is like they have they are concerned about nothing, so all they could do is focus on their weird neighbors. What happened is a kid spotted us last night when we were sleeping. He, he got up, he went to the garbage can, he took the body, and, and then he, he... Buried him in the backyard. And we were trying yeah. to figure out... We were talking about this, Cal. The Corey Feldman character, like, where are his how parents? Old? How, how old is how he? How old is he? Because when, when I was a kid, I always assumed he was a teen. Right. Like when I was watching this, I was like, oh, he's a teen like me and he's just hanging out enjoying the drama. And then I totally like for most of my life, just completely forgot about the scene where he's just having beers with Ray and like Tom Hanks comes over to smoke a cigar. And I'm just like, wait a second. How old is this kid? Like, how old is he? Here? I, he looks like a teen. It, like yeah, you telling me I think, that I he's, think he's not supposed to be. Yeah, but, but he's just chilling with the neighbor guy, drinking beers. But he's beers. also hanging out with the kids because he was like... It, well, I mean, I would invite my friends over too if this weird shit's going on. Like, I get it. Also, it's like... Well, but there's there's a line... He's got a line later in the movie where his the girl's asking him, what about your parents, parents. or whatever? And he says something along the lines, of, they're going to be home on Thursday. Like his, So his folks are just out of town and he's probably, you know, he's probably 18 or 19. He's got like he's got to be right. I feel like even though like the drinking age was like twenty one in like the eighties, I feel like because like those people grew up drinking at eighteen or nineteen, it probably wouldn't have been weird. 
I mean, if like, your parents yeah, aren't going to be home till yeah. Thursday, you're drinking. Yeah, yeah. But no, <laughs> the drinking. But not with the, the neighbor. That, yeah, no, not oh, with yeah, the adult yeah, neighbor. Enough, yeah. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. the thing I'm like. Well, I don't think any of these people really care about like, anything. Look, they are. They're drinking right now. We're well, watching. Yeah. We're watching. Like, how, how old is he here? Do you think Art Art is going to be the guy who's like, I don't know, show me your ID? I mean, like, Art doesn't care. He no, doesn't, Art's well, the guy that's going to so they, they to already buy know. Yeah, oh, he's yeah. going to make fun of you if you don't drink a beer. Also, Tom Hanks smoking a cigar just looks weird. Oh, I thought it, it looked. Co- I thought you were going to say it looked cool. No. Oh. No. Is this the one like time Jimmy, that smoking doesn't look cool? Tom Hanks <laughs> doesn't look cool smoking. Right. You've Am been on record as saying that that smoking looks cool all the time, no matter what. But look, look, look at him. He's just he's doing it slow. He's no, just yeah, I, even even the idea when he's talking about like, you know, I'm going to spend my vacation just hanging out and I'll sleep late and drink a bunch of beer and, you know, maybe smoke a cigar. I was like, I don't believe that for a nah, second. Nah, like, nah, that's like, the one part of his character that I'm like, ah, you, I don't know. You look at Bogue rip cigarettes. He's like talking with it and its mouth. It's like a part of his body. And here it's like it's like an unconscious part part of the body but here he's just like slow and methodical and it's just no you know the part that i didn't believe about his character when he was talking when he was like do you guys want to do you want to see my tools art and he like showed him his new tools oh no that's absolutely- the, that's the most the most real part of his character honestly well no it's like the fact that he's not, never, he doesn't like, know how to use those my, tools he's not going to use them tools my, he'll never use yeah. right exactly but but my the my father-in-law bought me tools and, like, and they look yeah, really like shiny out of it and that's it like that is the most real part of this character <laughs> Hell at yeah. least for me anyway i can i can for sure so what to what that. tool what tools what tools have you used and haven't you used in your your father-in-law I got, gift i got like three kinds of saws I mean, my father-in-law didn't get me all of them but you know it's they're here in the garage and maybe i'll build something i don't know yeah. uh that's not the point this isn't about me would, um, do, 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 would, like what do you do you have a couple of screwdrivers there pliers let's see what do you you want me to really go it's a couple yeah, of saws i'm, I'm kind of curious i got a good I drill wanna, oh you got power, i did i did or actually plug? just uh or did you go plug or battery yeah, yeah no it's see it's i went Makita. plug it's it's good i'm not going anywhere um, where i don't need a bet where i don't where i don't have access to a I, plug. I did just turn my kid's bunk bed into a clubhouse over over the break okay so you're doing more than tom that's Hanks? Yeah. yeah, so that yeah. I did, I did actually build more you're, than Ray from from the Burps. So you're you're handier than me. I've put together some I'd like IKEA. To think f- I am. I've put together some IKEA furniture, and I have mounted a TV, crookedly. Well, great. That's great. Impressive. So you can yeah. you can swing an Allen wrench. That's fine. Yeah. Well, um, I bought an electric screwdriver. That is probably the tool <laughs> I use the most. <laughs> That's. Well, anyway, what else are we talking about with this movie? We uh, are we on, are we on Bruce Stern yet, or we want to go here? We can get to we, Bruce Stern. I mean, we, yeah. we were we introduced to Bruce, Bruce Stern, dude. So I, that is a it is a very cool. I will say when we see Bruce Stern smoking, when we see yeah, the, see now Bruce another, Stern, that's knows a shot how to smoke. straight at. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but that's another shot that's straight out of rear window, window, right? Yeah, like definitely. the the glowing cigarette in the dark. Um, is Bruce Stern allergic to shirts in this movie? Because he's not wearing one for most so. of it. I, I like to think his way too wife, uh, way too hot wife likes it that yeah. way. And by the way, he's so cool that I'll allow him having a oh, wife no. that young and <laughs> like he's really cool. In this. He he is like yeah. the coolest Vietnam vet. Like he's yeah. just like, like I feel like that's how Vietnam vets in the eighties saw themselves, whether they actually were like that or not. But he's just like fifteen year younger wife. You know, I wear short shirts, short shorts. I uh, I always have my vest. I'm kind of balding, but my hair is just so long and frazzled that no one seems to notice. And it's just, owns it. You know, he just just doesn't give a fuck. He's and just clearly, sitting. there's still part of me that thinks I'm in the shit. Yeah, and he's just yeah. he's just fucking buying a twenty. But this this shot here, Jenny, this dolly just, dolly yeah, up. Look at this. Looking up oh, at him, putting really the cool. sunglasses on. It's great. It's it's like a great the shot. Pu- the puffer vest. He's wearing a bullet for Christ's sake. You know, he's he's putting yeah. out. <laughs> And I don't know why I didn't uh, like notice the, the wife handing him the American flag just of yeah. all the things to be doing in that scene. Yeah. <laughs> also, I um, can't believe that this, uh, speaking of this shot, when he, when like when Corey Feldman is just like, I notice you don't have any tan lines and it says it right in front of him. Which, my God. No, I that's forgot later, about yeah. that. Yeah. And then uh, the neighbor kid's a meatball. That's later, um, yeah. But no, I, I think your, your point, though, Cal, about this being such a, a, a weird snapshot of our country's history where there are these these cul-de-sacs that exist where nobody has any problems and not no because they're problems. super, super wealthy or anything like that. Like this is this is a decently common like that was a, the, the 
the funny thing that I always thought about Stranger Things too is like the real, the true nostalgia of, of Stranger Things is for a thriving middle class. Yeah. You yeah. know, like yeah. <laughs> that's, and that's, that's another, another, this movie is another example of that, of just like these guys, all they have to fill their time is like Bruce, Bruce Stern's biggest problem today is that he stepped in his neighbor's dog shit. Well, yeah. that's the thing. You kind of go nuts when you have the, no problems to keep you busy. That's why I think that's yeah. like one of the big points of the movie. It's like Tom Hanks has nothing to do but think about how much he hates his life, which is why he hates his life. Even his though life. his life is not it's in any he's way got difficult Carrie Fisher, or bad. Like, yeah, he's got like a healthy family. And in this and version nice of the things, he's got a job too. Yeah. So, like, yeah, he's got multiple TVs too. I don't know if the eight, like, I think the eighties was the multiple TVs is yeah. like the bar for I think, health. I, like, well, like, I think I feel like through the sixties and seventies, like. You had one TV. And then the 80s was like when you got to the point of when you got a TV in the bedroom. And then the 90s was when you got a TV in the kitchen. But, the, the, I mean, you go from Back to the Future just yeah. a few years earlier that, where it's like, oh, yeah, of course, we got two TVs. It's like nobody has two TVs. Yeah, exactly. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And yeah. then, like, here four years later in 1989, you know, there's they the have, like, tiny they, TVs in the did, kitchen in the breakfast he, nook. Yeah, the, did he just have a TV in, like, the fucking mud room? Yeah. Like <laughs> that's pretty outrageous yeah. actually the mud room. Yeah. yeah. But know, everybody have, has a mud room. Oh yeah. In yeah. Every, we Not in Los Angeles. Someone needs a mud room, 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 room in Los Angeles. I just realized why they're called mud rooms. Yeah. I never we thought we about it. We weren't tromping in muddy snow. You, yeah, anything, you tromp in your mud. Oh wow. Okay. No. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Um any more Bruce Stern business other yeah. than that he's So 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 this movie is the movie I've always associated with Bruce Stern until like I got older and then I realized how cool Bruce Stern was by going back into the 70s and like was it seeing... uh was it John Wayne he shot in the back was it I don't know that I sounds like a we- it... that sounds like a western I haven't seen uh, yeah I know you hate but... westerns but <laughs> but uh keep like, going like I'm gonna look the, it up. the king of Marvin's gardens was just him and Jack Nicholson as like is fucking incredible and like all the stuff that they did in the 70s it's just so weird and just so cool and I I came to that in college and I was just like wait fucking guy from the burbs as we all know him yeah he's also in one movie and by the way i'm wearing my scranton wilkesbury hat so you know representing home he's also he's also in the movie that championship season which was written and directed by um oh what the fuck is the guy the the priest from from the exorcist oh oh your um, guy yeah why am i blank? father damien yeah yeah um, why am i jason miller Jason right. Miller, Jason. who actually appears in this movie too. Wait, he's in this? Oh yeah, he's in it. This is yeah, the first clip movie. from The Exorcist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is in this movie. First movie so, we've talked about anyway, that has a call he, out to the other movie we he's talked in, about. He's in that championship season that was written and directed by Jason Miller, and it's an adaptation of his play, and it stars Bruce Stern, Paul Sorvino, Martin Sheen, uh, Robert Mitchum, and Stacy Keach. What this is it? like a movie that you made up. <laughs> too. Like, like just, just rattling off those details about it. It's like, if I had to make a joke about Cal's perfect movie, yeah. it, it would be the same thing. I li- li- listen, there a few cool things have happened in Scranton, but the fact that this movie was kind of shot there. Fucking a. That's great. Yeah. Um, let's talk, let's talk more about this breakfast nook though. Um, yeah. and the scene, because I, this is, this is the story of this movie for me, I think, I and mean, I think we've touched, we've danced around a little bit about, about it being just, it's, it's utterly solid, right? I don't think there's anything at all particularly wrong with this movie. Um, so it's like solid to, to great, like in parts, you know? And I think weirdly enough, I think this scene in the kitchen early in the movie, um, where, <laughs> yeah, first of all, he almost gets shot and, and just, doesn't react much to that. But the scene where Art comes in and he's eating all of this breakfast and this, the blocking in this scene is honestly perfect. And it's, there's not a ton of coverage and there's nothing flashy about it, but it's, it's worth studying in a way because there's exposition going on in the scene. There's character building going on in the scene. There's a lot of business happening yeah. in this scene, right? I mean, and the camera just subtly kind of moves to reframe the three shot when Carrie Fisher walks up, pans back down as people <laughs> move to the background uh, or come to the foreground. It like motivates camera moves. It's it, this, this sequence is so textbook perfectly blocked to me and that it, it keeps it interesting for it's, it's what, like a three minute sequence. And a lot of it is just like 
a lot of it is exposition but it keeps it visually interesting by like we see art get up and go to the the get fridge the and it hands it's hands around so that we get carrie fisher into the frame where they have a line and like the way that this blocking is constructed is so good it's just it's a, a clean perfect machine of of blocking a conversation between three people in a kitchen and i do think you get a lot of insight into the art Ray relationship here, because I think that's one of the more interesting parts of this movie. Cause at first you can't really tell if they're like best friends or anything. I still don't know if they're best friends by the end of this movie, they're neighbors. Oh, I think Ray know. hates him. Ray oh, hates yeah. him deep. Down. It's, he, it's a potluck roommate, you know, yeah. like you have to, you have to be, you know, uh, cordial at oh, yeah. because like, you or else your him. life is going to be hell. Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, years later, you look back on it and be like, oh, man, I hated my roommate from college. Uh, but you didn't at the time because you had to. to like I think, him, I, listen, you know? I think Ray, I think Ray is a great neighbor. I'm just putting that out there. Oh, yeah. I mean, this, he's letting his, <laughs> this guy eat his food. Like, he, look at him. Wait, he's, uh, he's, great. Well, well, I mean, because like, the- you know what? Like, he he's he's a yes and kind of neighbor that is like provoking him into adventure. And frankly, those are like you may not like that person like personally, but the fact that they're around and they're pushing you into weird situations, you know, you get anecdotes from these things. And like, you know, that it just makes life more full. Well, and that's the thing, like the parts of these of this movie where he gets galvanized is because of art. Like, otherwise, he'd just be sitting there drinking beers, being depressed as hell. And I'm not saying what he does at the end of the movie is anything. Enjoying his vacation. Yeah. Is he putting, yeah. is he put? Oh, holy shit. He just ate a rib and then he just shoved the whole pancake in. Listen, his he's ravenous yeah. and I don't and know I don't why. Know why I don't and there's a, I don't, I don't know why. There's, there's a, a pineapple, pineapple because he pulled it out of the fridge. He grabbed it out of the fridge. He's just eating all of their food. And then Carrie Fisher ends the scene being like, uh, <laughs> like, no, a scene that I really like is when, you know, you have Ray coming out uh, and he's kind of just walking the dog. It's late at night and you have that. I can't. Oh, Ricky, right. The Corey Feldman character. Mm-hmm. Ricky? Um, and yeah. art. And they're sitting on the porch, just hanging out. And then uh, art still that, starts that teenager talking. drinking beer with an adult neighbor, you know, and I really do feel like art probably pressured uh cory feldman drinking beer not that it took much uh he at least allowed it wait you think the adult is pressuring the teen to drink beer i think art movies? just encourages the worst stuff always i think art is <laughs> the glue that holds the cul-de-sac together uh, i mean a house explodes at the end i don't know if it's held together um <laughs> the house no my one likes. wife's home yeah. we'll we'll get to the we'll get to the ending at some point but the the yeah. fact that uh, art your wife's home and your house is on fire and he goes, my wife's home? Like, that's <laughs> such a... <laughs> no, but I love the little it's, ghost story. That's, yeah. that's another, though. That, that It's that, like, broad brush silliness that this movie does so well. No, but I, I kind of wish they, like, went back to the ghost story, the skip character that doesn't ever come back. But yeah. I, it just reminds me so much of, like, my suburban childhood and the ghost stories you used to tell about, like, your weird neighbors. It's just so universal to me. What, yeah. what, was, your, what, was, your, what was your urban legend? We actually, I had a Bruce Stern neighbor, okay. but he wasn't as cool. He was like also kind of a war vet. Yeah. Um, and we had a thought that he killed his dog because one day his dog just disappeared. I don't, I doubt that oh, was so true. So you're talking about like actual neighbors that you knew, not like, yeah, oh, yeah, not, not, not like not, ones not, that not, were not making the, up. Not the yeah. Homicidal soda jerk. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we had this thing called the Suskin Screamer. That was, that was. Do tell. Yeah. There was a bridge where like they would, if you drove over it with your feet on the floor of the car, that would alert the Suskin screamer and they would come and, and she would come out and kill you. So when, like whenever we went on burners, you always go over this bridge, but you had to lift up your feet while you were over the bridge. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's why I like the skip scene so much. Cause everyone has those, yeah. everyone has those weird yeah. little ghost stories that you just made up. Cause you were bored. There's, there's a bridge here in town that you're supposed to hold your breath. Oh over. yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? I will say, uh, my... I don't know. Some crazy ghost woman that lives under the bridge. I don't, I don't, Oh, you got to but like you're supposed to. I don't know what it too. is. I just, yeah, yeah. My, my dad has one. I did have an actual one, neighbor that. Yeah. And in his hometown, did, where he, you have to like honk twice when you're driving under the bridge, which has made some people think he's angry at them because he's just honking under a bridge. But <laughs> you, have to, you have to do it. He still does it. He's like 62. Do still does it. Yep. It's habit at that point. Well, there's a legitimate safety concern of why you honk at bridge, uh, under tunnels, at least, not a bridge. No, no, a bridge. It's a bridge. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because we have a tunnel that's a one-way tunnel, and you have to honk 
So if there's a car coming the other way. Oh, yeah, that's valid. No, this is just. Sure. Yeah. This is how you know that this is a really great movie because we're going deep in the. Yeah, we got tangents for days in this episode. (laughs) Um, We were talking about tools. But I tell you what, let's. It says something about the movie. Either either we're not as into the movie, so we want to talk about whatever, or the movie taps into something universal in all of us that we can associate to, and we want to share that part of ourselves you, you know with what? each other. It could be both at the same time. Exactly. Wow. That's what it is. Some of it, yeah. some of it is, is boredom. Some of it is, is actual engagement. Ever since his family has moved to this block, I've been noticing a, a weird kind of odor. Kind of like death. <laughs> there are two two scenes honestly in this movie that when when i think about the burbs i think about these two scenes one is the nightmare scene the nightmare s- the sequence where he's number one tom hanks's performance while he's watching the horror movies before he falls asleep is so funny like yeah. it's horror movies and people like it's texas chainsaw massacre screaming oh god please no And like, just like the most subtle kind of performance from Tom Hanks of being freaked out. And like, you could see the wheels turning just, just enough. And it's such an incredible, yeah, there's a, there's a guy, Jason Miller, but it's such an incredibly subtle performance from Tom Hanks that does a lot in, in this scene leading right up to the, to the nightmare. Um, cause you can see him start to get freaked out. But it's it's kind of what I was saying earlier. He has so <laughs> little to it's do still that pretty he's flat. Just, yeah, yeah, like yeah, he like but he has so little to do that he's just scaring himself and now he's having nightmares because he's bored. And That's he's, what happens when so, you have no and problem. He's, and he's so rich that he can afford to have a TV in his bedroom. Exactly. Like the first decade, he's not worried right? about money. He's on staycation. Now so he's so yeah. thoroughly middle class that no. he's got a TV in his bedroom yeah. on his staycation. Like did you guys have TV did you guys have TVs in your bedroom growing up? Uh eventually. Eventually, yeah, like teenager. Yeah, I think I think I had a TV in my room. So I had a TV I, in high school. I did, yeah. Yeah, but here's here here was the rub with me. Like our house was so old that it didn't have cable. So I had a TV in my room, but I didn't have cable attached to it. So I had a. You could watch basic cable though, like or not. No, 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 no. There was no cable. There was no cable. Oh, you had like no broadcast. Yeah. So all I had, I, I was purely VHS tapes. I mean, that's something. I guess. I I poked holes in walls to run cable up to my room. Uh, see, so so you were using, you were using tools at a young age. Exactly. Yeah. There's my tools again. Yeah. This is before I even had a father-in-law to give them to me. Um, the nightmare sequence is 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 funny to me. Just the fact that he ends up on a grill is just like it's also and, and again, I keep also I keep suburban. saying so yeah, suburban. I keep using the phrase broad brush, but like it's such a stereotypically suburban thing that turns into this nightmare. Like the imagery in this, it, it's it's such a fun combination of everything that he's learned so far. Like it's the, the weird witchcraft book that art brought over that he was talking about the, the incubus and the suck, like mispronouncing those names. Was oh, that when they were doing um, the chanting thing too? He's like, you're chanting, you're chanting. Yeah. All Satan's yeah. Also, you're chanting. <laughs> also, Satan's our pal. <laughs> also art doubling as the, uh, the soda jerk is just, yeah great yeah. yeah yeah it's just this great combination of like and even in the pop culture references that he just watched like the chainsaws there like the axe coming out of walter's head is uh, just so stupid well one of my favorite images the garbage is, man shows up it's it's wonderful the axe is not only coming out of walter's head it's coming out of queenie the, dog. the dog's head that queenie, made the dog's me laugh so yeah. there's also a scene i think just before this where uh, everyone's looking shocked, and it zooms in on Queenie the dog. Also, no, looking... that's that's the scene. Yeah, that's another yeah. scene that I want to talk about, Incredible. though. Which is, it's <laughs> the cool thing about that scene is that it's it, it's Ray and Art daring each other to go ring the doorbell, right? Yeah. And it turned they like it. it some uh, Morricone, Ennio Morricone score comes up. That was a temp score in the the work print. And apparently Jerry Goldsmith, who did the music for the rest of the movie, was fully intending to replace that with his own stuff, but he never quite got it right. So they ended up just licensing the Morricone stuff. And so it's like this this really sweeping, epic Western score to all of these zooms in on on people's eyes, which is, you know, it, it's 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 a funny little little parody. And then they zoom in on the dog's eyes, too, uh, which is is so goofy and so funny. And another example of how the movie is just like, yeah, we're going to do whatever. 
Well, like, those we'll are my do whatever those at, are any my given, favorite parts. at any given moment, just because we think it's funny. Like, I don't want to talk about it too soon, but there's, uh, I'll talk about it now. Just because I think now's it. the moment. Yeah. Cause Go when they, it. when they do, it's, it's the scene where, uh, Ray's dog is digging up the femur bone and mm-hmm. they, they don't even realize it's like human remains for a while. And then it's like, it goes on for like two minutes. I think the scene, yeah. and then they finally remain They're just throwing like, the femur back and yeah, forth yeah. To, to bring back. Yeah, exactly. And the moment that they do realize it's a human bone, they do the, the funniest zoom in oh, yeah, out of it. Going. Yeah. Like that's, I think that's the funniest part of the movie. for me. <laughs> Ray, this is Walter. <gasps> no! Well, and and they do it for long enough too, where Tom oh, Hanks so starts long. to trail off a little bit. Yeah. He's like, ah, ah, ah. Uh, well, I like think they I mentioned slow it down, before. Which is, like, which is great. My favorite bit is one that goes on just just too long, just yeah. too long, and that is one. Well, they, it, yeah, perfect. There's a self awareness too that that like it's obviously the characters aren't aware that that's what's happening in in the world, but the actors are, and the actor. It's it's an example of like a joke that you know, either Dana Olson, the writer, or Joe Dante came up with and communicated to the actors and the actors got it too. And they were game to play along. Like you can just kind of see the layers of this joke being built and then to see it like executed in the, in the right way, in a really funny way is it's great. And I frankly think it's funnier than the, than the zoom in on the dogs. Oh, I, th- face, I agree. You know, the, I love the zoom in on the dog, I, but the, the rrr, 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 yeah, is so that. funny to me. Yeah. yeah. And it also just caught me off guard, too, because I think that's the only time they use that back and forth effect. And when you only use it once, it's effective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's so it's so the artifice of it is so up front and center. Right. Like, that's not a thing that exists. No, like that's not a way anybody actually watches things happen. Right. Like, that's not a. Like you don't run back and forth at somebody to make a point ever, you know, like that's, <laughs> that's a thing that doesn't exist in the real world. And so when you see it in a movie, like it means something different and it's it sort of like it, it, you know, you have to break away from the, the idea that these are two real people talking to each other for a second. And like, that makes you laugh, but mm-hmm. it's I, either way, like the, the crash, the, the snap zooming back and forth is mm-hmm. I, it, one of the funniest moments in this whole. The other moment that I think about, uh, there's the nightmare sequence that I mentioned earlier. Then the other moment is driving the trash out to the street. That's, oh, yeah. I love um, that one too, yeah. It's so, so hilariously absurd. Um, but my favorite part of it is afterwards, it's starting to rain and Tom Hanks goes, I've never seen that. Clint, I've never I seen wrote that down as my favorite their- line. I've never seen that. I've never seen anybody drive their garbage down to the street and bang the hell out of it with a stick. On. I've never seen that. It's such like his reaction to it is so perfectly flat. Um, and that in that moment, like we watch this thing that's so bizarre and the music he's is, tr- is stinging yeah, in a way and there's lightning striking and it's like a fr- it's a scene out of Frankenstein for the most part. Mm-hmm. And then you just cut to Tom Hanks be like, I've never seen that before. Well, it's like, one of those it's, lines it's that such I a feel great like I, juxtaposition yeah. that it works so well. I feel like I have to steal that for my everyday life. And every time I see something really bizarre, I'm just going to have to say, I've never seen that. Like, it's I've, so funny for Alex, no reason. I've been doing that since 1989. Like, <laughs> Do you that's, say that? That's the, I've never seen that. <laughs> that is the line from this movie that I use in my everyday life where, like, I've never seen that before. I'm glad like, you the, think so, too, because I wrote that down as my favorite line. It's so funny. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no. and it's a tone thing, too, right? Like, it's it's the energy that he has with it. It's not that the line itself is that funny. Uh, no. Like, it's a great button for that scene, but it's it's the energy that he has that if you can replicate that when you say it and somebody else gets it, like, that it's one of those things where you're like yeah no i've seen the burbs too the other fun thing about that scene is uh so that the oh wait no this is so after that scene they kind of go nuts and try to get the uh garbage off the garbage truck and they're like making a whole mess yes you guys notice the the garbage on the street stays on the street for the entire movie (laughs) for the rest of the movie it's like the one blemish Good good for the garbage guys for not having to pick that up Oh yeah, they're like we I didn't do, make yeah, this yeah. mess. This is not Yeah. By the way, Clint, did you see that did you see that video I sent you guys on I did. Uh, yeah. on the garbage man flipping out on Corey Feldman? I do yeah. think Just fuck up, kid. I'm trying to act here. Basically, We're trying to act here. For, I don't really know funny. where you found Especially that. Especially for though. a guy who's uh, for a guy who's coming in to work on this movie for a day yeah. to like <laughs> throw that at Corey Feldman, which by the way, it's it's difficult to understate how big Corey Feldman was in in the late 80s. Like he was big. 
Corey well, like, Feldman and Corey Haim were Everyone was peak at this time. Enormous. Everyone in this movie. Yeah. Is like, I mean, like, what? This was, like, in, this was, Boys a was two years cast. earlier. Yeah. I mean, he did, let's see, because he, he did by Goonies me, a handful Lost of years Boys. before this. Goonies, the Stand By Me, The Lost Boys. Lost Boys. Um, yes. He was the voice of Donatello in he the Ninja Turtles movie, the first Ninja Turtles movie. good friends with Michael Jackson, which... Uh, well, uh, yeah, well, that's a whole other thing. Uh, yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> There's a documentary that's been made about that. Um, yeah. Well, even my man oh, Courtney other, Gaines was just in Children of the Corn, like a few. Years I was going to say let's Eat let's time. talk let's talk about the Clopex real let's quick because there's one scene that I adore with the Clopex that I think is um, worth talking about is when they go over to their house and like it, and the wives are there um, and they're actually inside chatting with them. It is that is, peak that is a great scene. Awkward yeah. on film. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Oh, yeah. it's great. It's legit great. And from Tom Hanks eating the, the sardine on the pretzel and then just like doing the weird sneezing thing until he, he, he just like swipes a piece of newspaper off off from off screen and like I guess spits out the sardine in it. But like it's so I love that I, like the Tom Hanks's physical comedy in this is is one of the best things about the movie honestly like he's he's hilarious running around and you know running away from the bees and doing the stop drop and roll to get get rid of the bees earlier in the movie and then this where he's sneezing and like it's he goes from understated to like big loud crazy in in a hurry which is a lot of fun that's where the like crushing the beer cans happens I, bruce dern does a good job in this scene too like when he like tri like trips and like falls through the porch and like Plus the brownies, and he's just like puts it back on the plate. A little something for your sweet tooth there. <laughs> well, also, uh, I, I we referenced this earlier uh, when Bruce Stern was like, "Oh, Klopix, is that Slavic?" And the and he just goes, "No, <laughs> no." It doesn't give an answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no. But, but I mean the the well, the silence in this in this sequence, and like the way that even the small talk that Carrie Fisher's trying to make, yeah. like it all sounds so stupid. Yeah. Like, and I think that's the other cool thing about this scene is that it makes like suburban niceties seem so stupid. Yeah. It's like, what do you, you don't care about these people. You don't mean anything you say, but it's like, yeah, it's, it was very moist the past couple of, uh, couple of days. It's well, like, that's the small talk that we're doing. And that's like, that's the standard that you're holding your neighbors to, which is dumb. <laughs> you know, like, well, I mean, and the whole premise of the scene, it starts off with uh, uh, Carrie Fisher and uh, Wendy Shaw. That's the, the other wife. Um, yeah. They're not going to the house because they're genuinely curious about the Klopex. They just want to prove like the husband's, the, the right. husband's wrong. That's the, the whole husband's wrong. Yeah. 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 Like, so they like, like just before this, they walk out and like you have this shot that comes down and you can see the American flag and they're they're marching like they're going to war. Like the women are like, this is our thing. We're going to make it right with the neighbors. Yeah. Like, no, they don't. What do they say? We're going to we're going to find out more in five minutes of just chatting with them. Yeah. You're going to find out and all your snooping. We're going to yeah. small talk so good. I also like, just love how they're dressed, too. Right. Like the like the wives are dressed in like white, like summery outfits. And they're just like going into this like old dank house and they just stand out like a sore thumb yeah and they kind of force uh, you know, their way it, into the house too like courtney Gaines doesn't really have a choice yeah, <laughs> just, no. no no i I, I like this scene a lot too because first of all i was really endeared to like the courtney Gaines character again because i i can't remember his hans his name is hans, hans um yeah. but first of all the the snack of sardines and pretzels is one of the funnier so things funny. like it's the saltiest thing but he's genuinely trying to be hospitable and courteous yeah but i mean even even that choice like building that as a joke is is important because like the choice is just like well they got to offer them something weird to eat yeah it's like i don't know sardine on a pretzel and like even tom hanks doesn't really know what to do with it like do i eat them at the same time i guess and, and like, by the way is... another thing that maybe after he eats the sardine on the pretzel the the uh wendy shaw character she makes a face and i to me it looks like the actress is breaking like she's trying so hard not to laugh but like it mm -hmm. comes off as her like gagging but it, it it looks so much to me that she's like trying not to laugh at tom hanks and i don't know if that's the truth yeah. but it it makes me laugh klopek what is that slavic no. That's my. But we talked question. earlier about how we're going to uh, talk about the Klopex. So here's our chance. Let's. We we were each assigned a Klopex. Yeah. 
Um, Alex, which you were going to talk about Hans, right? That Hans, my man. He has like maybe six lines in this entire movie, but he's great. I right. Think. Great neck beard. But he's got a presence. He's got a presence. I got a, I got a buddy that I grew up with whose uh, facial hair sort of naturally grows into... I. When he gets a little scruffy, I, I always used to call him. I was like, dude, you're, you're turning into the neighbor from the Burbs. And he's like, God damn it. And then he, he drove him crazy. It's a really um, iconic neck beard. What can I say? Yeah, it's do a you, it's a look for sure. Do you think that like Dwight's like cousin brother on The Office is just like loosely based on him? Oh. I think so. That, I mean, that's he's like, like, I, he's he like wears one like of the, the he, same clothes. Yeah, he's like one of the creators of The Office. That's like his cameo. Yeah. But like same vibe. Oh my god, it's the same exact. I think yeah. you might be onto yeah. something actually. What's his name, the cousin? Mose? Mose. Mo yeah. Moses? Is I it think it's Mose. Am I making that up? <laughs> We're looking this up. I don't know. That's for the episode about The Office. But um, Cal, did you want to talk about Henry Gibson? I love Henry Gibson. Uh, he's also a guy that, like, so this is the movie I most associate with Bruce Stern, who is a incredible actor and i feel like bruce Dern worked would be for decades yeah worked for decades and i feel like bruce Dern would be upset if like in my mind when i hear the name bruce Dern, the first thing i think of is the burbs uh probably it's, it's actually worse for henry gibson so the first movie i think of for henry gibson is the disney channel original movie the luck of the irish where he plays the <laughs> grandfather of the <laughs> Uh, of the leprechaun, of the kid, of the oh kid, my that, God. Right, of the kid that plays the leprechaun. Wait, that's how I know him really well. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm with you. Cause yeah. Like, yeah. So Wait, he's, he's one of these guys that like, he's such a distinct dude. Look like yeah, he, he, and he, like he, his look and his, his energy and his voice is so soft. Yeah. And, and like he, he, the way it, it's, he, you can't help, but whatever you saw him in first, but, he's but, the guy from that thing. Yeah. He's great at playing authoritarians, right? Like, so then I got to college and, you know, I was like, oh, film is an art. Let me watch some like artsy movies. And then, you know, eventually you get on onto Altman's Nashville and then you see him as Haven Hamilton in Nashville and absolutely destroys that role. Like he is incredible. You did like you like look at this guy and you're like, Fuck, I had no idea this dude could sing this good and just be like this like crazy right wing country star. And that's incredible. And then. Even before that, you're like, oh, that's the Nazi from the Blues Brothers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yes, he is. Yeah. Wait, I didn't... So, like, like, he is just, like, an incredibly talented guy that just pops up in the weirdest f***ing places. And, like, I've always remembered him, and I like, I, I, I like him a lot. And any time any, anytime I see him pop up somewhere, I'm always, like, pleasantly surprised like oh shit there's henry gibson he would i feel like he would be appalled if i was like oh my god you're the grandpa the from look at the yeah. irish yeah probably probably not i you know those those uh, i feel like i I've, I've heard enough stories where those those movies like the smaller things where like oh that actually did register great like that was a paycheck for me but if it meant something to you like yay i'll well, i'll, I'll it, take that you it's, know? it's like to make a carrie fisher connection i remember like a debbie reynolds was what? thrilled when people recognized her from halloween town which yeah. was like my introduction to her but like, this yeah. guy but this guy has a legitimate role in one of robert sure. altman's best movies and here i yeah. am just being like I remember you from the Disney <laughs> Channel original movie. All right, the well, cut it out. It's yeah. it's this is up to you to change. Um, I can't. Synapses can we... were made. I I can't. I can't rewrite <laughs> around. Yeah. Uh, the other Klopek, um is uh, Ruben, mm -hmm. who is played by a guy named Brother Theodore. Is what he went by in the credits. Which I I I saw Brother Theodore in the credits watching it just this week. Like this is a I. I feel a little bad that I'd never heard of him or looked or bothered to look him up. I thought he was just a, a you know, I mean, he's working that on he's character actor. He's working. That he is, he is leaning into what he's doing, but I, I looked him up. This dude is fascinating. Um, he, first of all, he survived Dachau. Uh, he was later deported from Switzerland for chess hustling. Uh, chess then his hustling? family friend. Yeah. Yeah, he was hustling With people at chess, chess and got deported from the country Switzerland. Hustling by hustling, like yeah. successfully. I'm not like, exactly sure how. That's that, it's not. I think a, he was just stealing that's money not a from euphemism people. for cheating, is it? No, correct. Chess <laughs> hustling. Okay. Uh, then his family friend Albert Einstein helped him immigrate <laughs> to the United States. 
where he started working as a janitor and a dock worker before he found his way to being a monologist, which is where he r rose to notoriety and, and made like in the sixties and seventies. And he, he made a lot of the, uh, the late show round, the late night rounds and all that stuff. Um, but the fact that he was, he was a, a, a wealthy from a wealthy family and then like had, he survived Dachau in the, in, in the Nazis and like, deported for chess hustling like the just the bullet points of this guy's life are fascinating uh but and then county like for me to sit here and think oh it's that guy from the burbs um feels painfully reductive <laughs> you know for everything that I, this guy's I done i don't think they through. mind like, I, don't know. I, I don't know i can't imagine that they do you know yeah. like, who, who knows i will say this bruce stern in the time since the burbs has given me one of my favorite lines that I use constantly, which is beer ain't drinking. There you go. There we go. Now, all I had about Courtney Gaines was that I liked him in Children of the Core and he's got a great neck beard, but yeah. Yeah. Something. Well, both, I mean, listen, <laughs> all of these things are true. Um, are there any other brilliant moments we need to talk yeah, about? Yeah, that's a problem. This, this movie, movie. kind of has a bit of a lack of them. Well, that's the thing. Like, I, it's I, got I, a handful of good ones, and I, and it's frankly, got, like, it's it, brilliant. It should it be a word interesting we conversation. Use. It has I highlights. Reserve. It has highlights. We, yeah. we're, it's it's the name of it's the title of a segment. I don't I know, know that it necessarily. Uh, uh, but, I, I under I understand um, the need of the show versus the, <laughs> the, the versus the actual brilliance versus like you know the regard in which we hold the term brilliant. Right. Right. Um, so I, I feel like we can move on. Well, I, I, say, guess, though, I guess what I'm just did, trying to say is like last it, week we were talking about like Rear Window and Alfred Hitchcock's directing and, you know, legitimate yeah. brilliant moments that changed cinema for forever and I mean, how cameras I'm, are used. I'm happy. And, I'm happy to gush about blocking kitchen conversation sequences all day long. Because, wait, I want to feel I, like I did that already. We yeah. should talk about the end, though, I feel, because that to me yep. is where the movie should have. So at the end, uh, so he they're in the Klopik's house doing just terrible things to their neighbor's home and uh they hit a gas line and the house explodes and uh ray is injured terribly and he gets into this fight with art where i whereas i feel like this is where the printe printes is gone he's like it's your fault art like blah blah, blah. Yeah. and like they realize i think that they're the crazy ones which is like and ultimately they were right the clopics were uh not good well that's and that's that's the funny thing too i, I think because they do that's that's part of ray's whole whole rant at the end but like we're the we're the ones climbing fences and peeking through windows and like they of were. course they're they're of course they're just sticking to themselves why would they want to talk to us like we're monsters like like that realization and that whole rant is is like largely the point of the movie that right yeah. that's like say the title of the movie in a, in a monologue real quick um but then i the fact that I I don't think that they did learn. Like they clearly didn't, because ultimately they were proven to be right about them, which was just in an a, accident. In a different way, right? yeah, it was an accident because the whole Walter thing. They didn't kill Walter. Walter, they were right. getting Walter's mail, but they were terrible in a different way. They killed that. What was it? Yeah. the Naps or what was it? The, the previous the, owners. The previous yeah, the owners. Yeah. yeah. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't, it's kind of what, like you, what we were talking about with rear window, like, yes, the murderer was bad, but so was the Jimmy Stork character for being yeah. a straight up voyeur. <laughs> They're both because art, art learns absolutely nothing. He's like yeah. already back on the news saying, be like, you better watch out crazy people. Cause we're coming after you here in the burbs. <laughs> like, and he, by he the, learns yeah. absolutely nothing. I, you know, and, and for, uh, and even Rumsfeld, even, even Bruce Dern, like marches past Ray at the end, pats him on the shoulder. Be like, we got him buddy. And like, nobody well, learns won, any he finally won I think Ray, war. I think Ray does so. too. Yeah. Ray, Ray learns something to a certain extent in that he's just like, I'm gonna go away for a minute. Um, yeah. But Maybe nobody else a bad influence. anything. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I also do. I, as far as like, like I was saying earlier, I like the exasperated acting that Tom Hanks does here when he flops on the gurney and says, take me to the hospital. I'm sick. Yeah. Like him just throwing a child. And then he picks up the tantrum. gurney and throws the gurney <laughs> in. He <laughs> throws so the gurney into the ambulance and then flops down on his stomach. Like, I'm not going to look at you. No, take me to the hospital. Yeah. I'm sick. Like such a baby. It's so funny. <laughs> well, because even like all of the guys, in the, you know, um, uh, Rumsfeld and Art too earlier in the movie when they're like, can literally can Ray come out to play? Yeah, and Carrie Fisher has to say no. 
no, he can't. And I'm like, oh, come on. And I think at the like, scene too, do... Carrie Fisher comes up to the ambulance. It's like, you okay, honey? I'll meet you at the hospital. Yep. Like she's just like which unfazed. Is, which tired. is why I like, I know that she could have, she, I will not argue that she could have had more to do in this movie. She could have had a real I zinger do, here. I do really she's appreciate. She's a script doctor for Christ's sake. Like yeah. she could have yeah, inserted. I, <laughs> I do really appreciate the level of energy that she brought to it though, because of this yeah. sort of like, okay, yeah, whatever. Sure, I'll see you at the hospital, like, honey. She's just. Take a breather. Yeah. Like, yeah. Cause like, I have no doubt that at any point in the movie that she, like, she loves the guy. She loves her husband. Mm -hmm. And, but also she, he's kind of an idiot. Yeah. You know, um, but anyway, yeah, I wanted to make sure we touched on the ending because also this is where it, I, I, I touched on this earlier, but like it's where it flirts with the horror more because I don't really feel like mm -hmm. this is like a comedy horror movie as much as it is like a comedy with like, I don't know, some horror spoofs, but like I like the ending a lot more than a lot of the other of the movie because it's the most horrific. Like this man almost exploded. <laughs> yeah, like I, and then he almost yeah. gets. Like that's why I killed, wish kidnapped he died. and killed by the yeah. yeah but I don't know uh, I somebody would have there would be a lesson to learn had he yeah. exploded or had he died or or whatever but like as it stands like nobody learned anything well you know there wasn't really much to learn it was the Reagan it was the end of the Reagan eighties you know <laughs> exactly everybody was just to, doing sir, great. to full circle this yeah nobody had any problems no one had any problems um, life was great I think the message to uh, psychos fanatics murderers nutcases all over the world is uh, do not mess with suburbanites because uh, frankly we're just not going to take it anymore movie lists going to be a quick segment uh, <laughs> this time around <laughs> it's not on any what what well, when are we going to make the best cable movie? When are we going to make the best cable movie, mo ma the best cable movie list? Because I think this will be on that. Top 10 movies where if you see it on, you'll stop and watch the rest yeah, of it, regardless like, of where oh, it is in the runtime. The, in the, the best enders of channel surfing. Yeah. 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 It'd be on that list. Yeah. It'd definitely be I, I, I'm, I'm sure it's gotten a, a shout out at some point. Like this movie has been too, too big a part of my life to never even get an honorable mention on something somewhere but i couldn't find it so it's entirely possible that no I mean, we've just never talked about I, the burbs once it's kind of to what we were saying it's a really stacked cast it, it, the pedigree is undeniable but it's no one's best yeah. thing it's not tom hanks's best thing or joe dante's best thing in my opinion right i wish that this if this movie was like the mid of 1989 i wish that like the mids of 2023 were as good as this. It, well, yeah, that's the thing. Like we're sitting here talking about, is this, you know, whether or not it's somebody's best movie and like, yeah, it's fine and it's okay. But like, honestly, if this were the baseline for yeah. all movies, yeah, like, yay, that would be wonderful. Yeah. I don't, this is, like, there's, I'm going to give 2020, the, the 2020s a little more credit. I feel like we've, had some good movies comedies uh yeah no that's one thing i'm mad about we need more comedies comedies, comedies i will think i will say are, are on their way back a little bit a little yeah. bit Bottom, they're, they're, even, even, they're on their way there's been a couple of good ones bottoms this year. Bottoms, bottoms was, was a lot good. of fun yeah. um uh no hard feelings was, was awesome. way more fun Very than it had fun. any right to be like we're making um, a comeback i haven't seen that rom-com with uh glenn powell and sydney sweeney yet but i hear that that's i haven't seen it either okay yeah. the, anybody but you or whatever yeah that's, yeah but point is like if the burbs were the minimum right the minimum standard for how good a movie should be we would be in great shape yeah I like agree. the movie it's a good movie it's great there's there's nothing at all wrong with this movie I think like it could have been better. I maybe think it the been whole better. is less than the sum of its parts. Yeah. But in a, and I I do think it gets bonus points for some nostalgia for some like for me anyway probably because like I, I will say this I well no I'll save that for where's it, where's it rank we got to get to let's do Torf. All right, Torf. Yeah. True or false. Queenie the dog as yeah, you were called. This is the one. Uh, Queenie was portrayed by Rhapsody, the very same Bashan Frise who played Daphne in Look Who's Talking Now and Chloe in Beverly Hills Chihuahua 2. True or false? False. I, I'll go with, you, you seem way too confident to disagree with you about that. She's picking, go the, she, she's picking the wrong movies. It was Ty, but I, I, know, I know Beverly Hills Chihuahua is too recent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that is that is false. So it is true that it is false. <laughs> yeah, but do you do you know anything more about the dog? Yeah, I do. It's the uh, dog from. Uh, um, uh, you can do it. It's great. It's a great fun fact. Yeah, it's uh, Silence of the Lambs. Yep, 
It's Buffalo Bill's dog. Oh, in nice. Dog in the yeah, Silence of the Lambs. Buffalo Bill's dog. Her name is Darla. I like that this was. Your, I like that this was your silent. You know, Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm channeling Buffalo Bill here. You know. No, yeah, but that yeah, is. You know, yeah. Yeah. That is Buffalo. That's my maybe my favorite fact ever. Uh, that's that is incredible. Buffalo Bill's and now dog. that's I, and now With I'm the motion in the basket. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> You, you know, you're talking about how we're going to for sure talk about Naked Gun at some point. We are for sure going to talk about Silence of the Lambs oh, at some point because that is yeah. super high on my list. And yeah. now I'm thinking about that dog and, and mad at myself that I didn't the recognize The dog is not a small dog. part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Um, no. And uh, more more kudos to Darley. She, uh, Darla. She also appeared in Pee Wee's Big Adventure and Batman Returns before sadly passing away in 1992. Oh, as, she was like the big legend. scary clown's dog, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah, what an accomplished, what an accomplished performer. What, I mean, you think about you think about that resume, and think about an actor having the same resume, and what we would think about that actor. Yeah. Like, if somebody were in all of those movies, you're like, oh yeah, they had bangers on their resume. You know? Is that the is that their the Henry Gibson? Is that the Henry, is that the Henry is that the Henry Gibson of dogs? Maybe. I, I mean, I all know. killer, no she filler. Might be higher as far as like, yeah. yeah, I'm concerned. Oh uh, yeah. All right. So uh, R.I.P. Darla. We love right. you. Yeah. Can um, you get to the torf about the monsters? No, uh, uh, no. Uh, why don't you twerf us? Give us the twerf. Oh, it's the, the same street as the monsters. True oh. or false? It's true. I, yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's clever. It's on the Universal lot, and it's it's. They actually, I did oh, a. Oh, you uh, mean the actual drunk. physical same street? Not the actual like they street. Use the, yeah. They not use the same street name. It's like Correct. shot on. They the filmed same it in the same place. Studio yeah. lot called the sack. I'm gonna. And it's also the place where any of you fans out there that uh, were also working the Halloween, uh, the reboot. Halloween one, the reboot back a couple of years ago. That junket, same street. The, the might have the, seen the, you there. The the Rob Zombie, the Rob Zombie reboot. No, they the, yeah, it was. I talked I talked to Jamie Rob Lee Zomb- Curtis. Rob Zombie uh, the on creator, that street the, is what I'm the, trying to say. The director of the monsters. I'm no, gonna, no, the the uh, the Blumhouse one. Oh, uh, okay, okay. I'm gonna perfectly perfectly segue into what was a torf, but I'm altering it slightly. Ty, I'm throwing you off, Tyo. Yep. Uh, to make it about Desperate Housewives? God damn it. That's literally what I was about to do. <laughs> My twerp was going to be that Desperate Listen, we're Housewives. we're running low on time, so I'm fast forwarding through Wow, turf. that was turf. good. I'm that was really, really good. About that. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, so. It's a, it, listen, it's a street on a back lot. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's and you can tell, too, The number the of movies that were shot in the New York street in uh, on the Fox lot, like, is, like NYPD Blue took place yeah. in Century City. You know, like, it's, so. Anyway, uh, okay, so we we know that it was shot during the writer strike. True or false? True. That meant well, that's true. Uh, we kn- that meant the cast improvised heavily throughout. True or false? I mean, it depends on how you def- define heavily, but I will say true. They did use. Yeah, I think I think that. true. They they improved a bunch. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, uh, no one was ever happy with Unless the script. It's- the way it was, Dante said on this picture, we had to smooth out the rough edges ourselves. Uh, luckily, Tom has a very good sense of what works for him, which makes me think, Clint, earlier you mentioned how the coffee throwing at the paper boy seemed like improv. I feel like yeah. that probably, yeah, probably was. was. Yeah. I Honestly, they, they're just a bunch of people making a movie that they knew, like, this needs to be funny to us first, and the rest will take care of itself. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the, the energy of this movie. Yeah. These, these guys it's were goofy. The top. It's these goofy guys were as hell. The top of their game, too. Yeah. Yeah. Even the garbage men who told Corey Feldman to shut the fuck up. (laughs) We're trying to act, kid. (laughs) Shut the fuck up. We're trying to act. Trying to do some. (laughs) You're trying to do some (laughs) acting. So so good. (laughs) Just put him in his place. Uh, Okay, Torf. Uh, The film was originally supposed to open and end with the theme from Mister Rogers' Neighborhood. True or false? I'm gonna go with true. I bet that was an. Yeah, yeah, I I I bet that was an idea they had at some point because it it wound up in the middle of the movie also. So I feel like any. I feel like that was the kind of thing. It's like, well, we got to work Mr. Rogers in here somewhere. And it wound up in the middle. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, it was meant to be an homage before Jerry Goldsmith came on board and wrote his completely original score. Which, by the way, this Jerry Goldsmith score is kind of all over the place. It really is. Like, I, I didn't want to yeah. criticize it, but it's a... I mean, it's yeah. far for the course well, of the burbs. Yeah. It doesn't do one thing. And then also they cut to... The fact that they ended up using the Morricone stuff is like, it's... It in a way it becomes a series of sketches mm-hmm. uh, at some point. Like there's not a ton of cohesiveness through it, but I mean it's fun. It's fun music, but yeah, it, it, I guess it does its job. Yeah, 
Um, all right, I got one more tour. We got time <laughs> I for it? Guess. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay, yeah, go for it. it. Uh, Let's hustle through it. As we mentioned, uh, somewhat uncomfortably, uh, Corey Feldman and Michael Jackson have that. Uh, but Michael Jackson's pet oh. chimp, Bubbles, had to be banned from the set after pooping all over Corey Feldman's trailer. True or false? God, God, God I, hope I hope that's, that's true. true. I really hope that's true. Yeah. So I'll, it, take, I'll take false if you really want to take true. I'll go true. So one, only, Okay, I'll go false. Yeah. Only one of us will be right. Yeah. It's false, but that was a real rumor at the time. That- it was a rumor that didn't happen on like I was I wish you were going to tell me that was it's that, true. On, it was that actually happened on this movie. <laughs> no. It's true that it's a rumor. It's true that it's a rumor. <laughs> well, it's kind of it reminds me of yeah. like the Indiana Jones thing where everyone thought like the fly was on the guy's lip, but it actually anyway. Um yeah. Feldman has debunked this myth himself. He revealed that there was a monkey on set, not a chimp, uh, but that it belonged to a fellow cast member. Uh, he explained it, and I was like, "Oh my god, I love monkeys!" I Wait, love so there guys. was a monkey yep. shitting all over his his <laughs> his his, his uh, trailer, but it just wasn't bubbles. I don't I don't have that information on hand. So, because all right, I tell you what, we're gonna have to no, we're gonna wait, have to there, get some. There's three parts to I, the story: that, that there's a monkey, that there was shit, <laughs> and that that monkey may have been bubbles. I'm so sorry. Tayo just left the note. There was no shitting, which is my favorite. There note was I've, no shitting. There was no shitting that they've ever gotten. Okay. So there, there was a monkey. So I'm gonna who, take that. I'm gonna take that to mean that Bubbles was there, but was causing other problems that got him banned from set. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't like. He didn't like the crafty selections. So he just. It was, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, was, to clarify, was, they didn't have the right granola there was, bars. Yeah. You there know was a, Nature's Valley. The 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 rumor there was a monkey on set. That is true. They thought it was Bubbles because of the Michael Jackson thing. But this monkey was innocent and did not shit all over the trailer. That's and that's it for tour. But no no word on whose monkey it was or. <laughs> no, how it, it was a cast. It was a it was a uh, it belonged to a fellow cast member. A fellow cast member. Lovely. Yeah. Great. Eighties. Got to be the eighties. This is the eighties. Yeah. Again, not a single problem to be had yeah. anywhere. Everybody's just um, high fiving. But people, guys, but, America. Yeah. <laughs> what are we say. gonna do about this surplus? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it for Torf. <laughs> Keep an eye on the neighborhood for me. You betcha, Mr. Peterson. No problem. <laughs> All right. Who's who's your MVP, guys? I. I don't know if I'm gonna have the same one as everyone else. Uh, for me, it's it's Rick Ducumin. May he rest in peace. I, I, he just stole the show. From really? Me. Yeah. I don't. I, okay. He just every scene he was in, I thought he was the best part of it more than Tom, even more than Bruce Stern. I I just thought he just sold that role. Yeah, so I'm, well. I'm with you. I love yeah. Rick. I, again, he's the glue that holds the neighborhood together. Yeah. And he's funny. Like okay. that. That's a trope. Yeah. That's a role that could have just been a stupid trope. But he just he made me laugh. Huh? Yeah. No. He he. I don't he, know. Maybe maybe it's the the, the father-in-law way. tools. Maybe it's the fun. Yeah, that for sure. I, I will agree that he he over delivered. Like in in a cast as stacked as as this one was, to how act Tom fucking Hanks? For, think, well, for I him to make more of an impression on somebody than than Tom Hanks and Bruce Stern and everybody else is that's something else. Like that's that that's saying something. I will say this though, Bruce, um, Bruce Stern in a in a beret. Oh yeah, Bruce Stern. He pulls pulls that, he pulls yeah. yeah, like I mean, like I can't pull off a vest in a beret. So like you people can. Well, not with that attitude. No, you're right, which is why I'm not Bruce Stern. <laughs> you gotta own it. Yeah, I, I'm giving mine to Hanks though. Like, I maybe it's maybe it's the father-in-law tools thing that like I just so associate with Tom Hanks in this movie that I think art is is too grating for me to give give that actor the MVP. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm 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 sort of like. It's a kayfabe thing for me. Like I'm a pro wrestling fan about this about this movie in terms of like, no, I don't like him. He's 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 off because I feel the way that Ray feels about art. That's fair. About you're lucky. Art. You're lucky. I don't live near you because I'll just like roll into your house, just like raid your fridge, just be like, dude, what the f- is with this? Guy? Well, that's why I'm doing all of these remote. Yeah, I will say I have been both. I've been the art and had the art, so I I get it. But the art is a necessary like it's a he's a necessary role in a society. He's just nosy, but he's in a society. But to my point, I think I would have really disliked art if it wasn't Rick Ducumin. I just think he's, and it's it's not an actor I was super familiar with Listen, either. I don't. What he's, else is that character Cummins is? So what, Mike, like we've talked a lot about Bruce Dern, Henry Gibson, Tom Hanks. Well, he did a lot of stand up, and my and our coworker Tom reminded me that he was in the uh, 1994 Disney classic Blank Check. Which is kind of similar vibes to Luck of the Irish, but that's I think I, yeah, my yeah, first yeah, intro yeah. to him. 
He was in Groundhog Day too. Oh yeah, that's right. Who is he? We've we've seen him. He was one of the one of the drunk guys uh, in the joyriding mm -hmm. sequence. I I think right. Yeah, I know. Yeah, um, like a bar. Someone in a bar. Yeah, he was he was Gus yeah. in in Groundhog Day. Yeah. He's got a. He's uh, got a and of course he was in Hunt for Red October. Mm -hmm. No, he's got. I mean, he's got a good IMDb page. And of course, Disney classic. Oh, he was the guy in Die Hard. He was the lose you, lose the grid or lose your job guy in Die Hard. Oh. He's gonna end it so that he's gonna end up on. Uh, we're gonna talk about him again on yeah. this show. See, Rick, you coming? Um, Love you, buddy. Rick, you coming? Yeah. I uh, I don't know. I still got to give it to Hanks, but I I Jesus appreciate Christ, it. As, this guy's as dead. A, yeah, he died. Uh, like he died pretty young too. <laughs> Holy diabetes. shit. I know. That's he what I'm died saying. in 2015. We love you. Killed it. Yeah. Young man. He was 60 something. Yeah, so. Uh, who do you think Nicolas Cage should play, guys? I Rick DeCommon? <laughs> no, I struggled with this. I mean, I... we can't we can't do that now. Not after right. not after that segue. Uh I I I I I I think that like There's a lot of options. But I don't know if I like it. like I feel like the obvious one is Rumsfeld. Yeah, I was just gonna say I, I'm I'm either yeah. I'm either going with present Rum day Nick Cage yeah. as yeah. as Rumsfeld. Yeah, it wouldn't suck. I think it, no, it wouldn't. No, suck. I think it's I, great. I, I want to see I want to see like um uh bad lieutenant port of call Nicholas Cage as Rum as Rumsfeld. Like that's yeah. it, I feel like one of the 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 prompts for this uh segment is would the movie be better and i would really miss bruce stern but nicholas cage would be no i think nicholas cage could deliver a bruce stern-esque performance no he could he could yeah, yeah. i i don't think i don't think it's worse no i don't I don't, th I don't think it's worse whether yeah. or not it's better i don't I, know but like if you do if you do uh instead of vietnam vet um like, rumsfield if you yeah. do like retired but was corrupt when he was on the force. Oh Cop, yeah. No Rumsfeld. He, he, he could do. So he, it's literally like literally the character from port of call new Orleans, like moves so, to <laughs> moves yeah. to the burbs. Yeah. That so, would be great. It's just so, a sequel. So yeah. You know, you know how yeah. I, you know how I judge these kind of like, is it offensive if we, we replace a guy with Nick cage, right? Which is like, if this person dies, is the movie that we're thinking about replacing him in part of the headline of his obituary? If not, then it's fine. So, because like, because so I Bruce, so the Burbs is not getting a mention in Bruce Stern's obituary. It might be getting a, a mention in like a lower paragraph, but it's definitely not the headline. In the one that I write, anyway. Yeah, yeah. The well, Burbs star. Yeah, Bur Bruce Burbs Burb star, star Bruce, Bruce Stern. Stern. Dead man. If he dies between now and the time that we put this episode out, oh. we're gonna have to. We're gonna have we're, some editing to do. We're gonna we're, <laughs> no. We're gonna have some. We're gonna have to some comments to pen. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna be fine. He's all um, good. he's he's great. He's doing great. He's, he's, uh, he and Laura both just yeah. top two Derns consistently. Great Derns. Great Derns. Um, all right. Where did you guys have this ranked? That, nowhere. <laughs> this is not on my. Nowhere. I think, I think I enjoyed talking about it more than I enjoyed watching it. I was even telling Cal before this. I, like, I think this. I I think it's a pretty average movie. Is, I think I've liked it, it more after talking about it. This for, is a delightfully mid movie. It's mid. It's yeah. to me. It's yeah. mid. Like I think I, I'm gonna go up or mid. I, sure. Sure. I'll sure. go up or mid. I, I, but I mean, it's mid I'm nonetheless. Not gonna fight you, buddy. If you if you want to section it in upper mid, that's fine. You it's. It, I gotta. I gotta. I got a lot of strata that I have to fill uh, out. I mean, know. listen, I mean, you're the one. This is how you write. This is how this you is, write movie lists. You got to get, if I got to get work 10 categories out of like, you're the one who has to different just, movies that are great on TBS. Like the, I got to, you're be the one to, who has to justify aligning with Dan here. Not us. <laughs> Clearly I do. <laughs> so I had it at number, I had it at number 86. Holy. And wait, we on my list. We've been assuming. 86. That's pretty. That means 86. that there are 50, there are 14 movies that you think are worse yet still that still it's still top 100 worthy. that are still yeah. worthy of but listen, uh, ranking. I mean this here here's my thing. This is three amigos all over again because Dan Dan by the way had it at 25. <gasps> 25. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay, but I we mean, were right we that start... that's a Dan ass movie though. I knew the minute <laughs> I saw the burbs I was like this is Dan if I've ever see dan if dan i know anything hell. about dan this is dan yeah yeah so dan had it at 25 i had it at 86 now, i mean and this is three amigos again 
And yeah, so but it's, what it's we talked the, about at the start, the, it's lesser. Robin Hood again, by yeah. the way, Cal. I, I'm, I'm look, not going to lump this in with Seven Samurai, so you're off the hook, Alex. Yeah, but God. the we all have I, our. I, I will say that I oh, I'll did have not, mine. Just you wait. Yeah. Just you I, wait. I did not enjoy this movie revisiting this movie near as much as I did. Like Three Amigos, I watched and I fell in love with it again. Yeah. And this one, not so much. Well, that's my thing. Um, like I, I, I genuinely this as is a, a yeah. this is a top one hundred. The cover image of this video is going to say top one hundred. Is all I'm trying to say. I and think you're Dan, pretty. Dan you're had it at 25. I had it, and then and and I then, had, like no. We that's have, well. Let's here's what we have a we have we a midnight do. cowboy episode that has not 100 in the cover image. That's number like 275. A, 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 a best <laughs> a best picture winner. That yeah. the, the only yeah. X-rated so, best picture winner is in not 100, but the f***ing burbs. But go go watch our midnight cowboy episode for the the nuance in that X-rated discussion. But. <laughs> You got his, You guys got an envelope there. Open it up. See where we're at. Make sure you open it up the right one, because you have two there, right? I got two. Here's the strike one. Just so you, just so you know, this is the envelope. I don't. I'm not opening yet. I had a. Uh, I had it at 86. Dan had it at 25. You guys didn't have it ranked at all. Where does yeah. that? Yeah. Where do you? Uh, well, we've learned how much of a bonus you get for being on multiple lists, but this is only on two. I'm gonna say 60. Ooh, that's where I was going. Yeah. It was 60 what? 60. 60. 60. Right. 60 even? I'm going to go 61. 61, Bob. You, you're going to go prices, oh, screw right? Rules? You. Yeah, yeah we're, go, we're always going to go crisis. All right. right well, rules. do I still get, do I get to, I'm going to go 62 then. Oh, you're going 62. Oh. You're going to get extra hosts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ready? This is, this is one of those episodes of The Price is Right where the third person in line just stares daggers at that last person. <laughs> All right, ready? Am I, what? No. It's 62, isn't it? Son of a bitch. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Oh, thanks, Bob. I'll be on stage for it. the uh, showcase showdown momentarily. The price is right. <laughs> oh, I'm so mad. Oh, that's 60. good. No, I honestly, I wouldn't have been there, Alex, if you hadn't uh, hadn't <gasps> gone with sixty. Which is why, like, I can't to believe I laid up the ball so you guys could throw it in the net. Yep. Jesus Christ. No, that's the danger of going first. <sighs> that's on, on me. That's sixty-two. On, that is on me. So. We're striking let's, this, right? Let's I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bask in that uh, at even a little bit. So we're gonna pop we're gonna we're gonna pop this bad boy open, right? As as the only one of the three of us that had it on his list, I am more than willing to yeah. kill. But him. you've already like made a, a I, okay. Can I say something? It it's been weighing yes. on me. I'm really upset that we struck three amigos. I uh, it it literally I've lost. So you so do you <laughs> like, do you want to have the like, sunken listen. cost fallacy that we're gonna keep a no. lesser movie because you feel bad? I'm about really the three upset amigos? that we. I'm really upset that we killed three amigos, but I'm more upset that Cal wouldn't let us kill Robin Hood. Yeah, you know. So, yeah, that all keeps gonna, me awake at I'm night. I'm gonna figure. I'm gonna figure like, out. Oh, how to what get are you some living in the suburbs that. in the '80s? That's your biggest problem. Yes, is I didn't let us kill the <laughs> king. Listen, Robin Hood. Currently, listen, yeah. I'm doing okay. You know, <laughs> I, so, uh, I I've had an old fashioned and a half during this episode. So, like, yeah, that's my problem right now. Are we? Are, are we? Are we? Are we doing this? I'm fine with striking it. Are we, are we striking it? Yeah. Let's strike it. There's yeah. got to be. There, there, there's got to be. I can guarantee there are three or four better movies. In and there. I, that, I yes. always want to see what's in there personally. So, yeah. Let's do it. There could be anything in the box. It could Even be three amigos. And, and I I think that I think that uh, the Burbs is is fun and everybody should watch it and it's a totally solid movie yes. i don't need it on my I, top I caught, I caught i caught one of them i know it's on my list and already i know that these are all better movies all right ready okay what do we got number one my cousin Vinny. oh i do like that <laughs> is that on my list i don't remember i, I do be. like that movie it should, it should be i do like you that know, movie a lot. talk about your talk <laughs> about your peak tbs yeah. that is such a, I've only ever seen it on cable. You know, I don't the, think I've ever seen if, it. If, if you don't have, if you don't have this on your list, that's the problem. You. I don't think I do, but I like it a lot. All right, number two, being there. Jesus Christ, is this the Calibro movie list? We just replaced this with all my. <laughs> did you fill up this envelope? <laughs> I do love being there. I did also I it, banger. I'm I, I'm I'm happy to happy to go to bat for Hal Ashby any old yeah. time. All right, all right, next, the Sting. Okay. Kind of that one. That one was uh, in the Three Amigos envelope. I, th I think we passed uh, yeah, over that one no, too. Yeah, no, that seems familiar. Well, you guys for not like loving having as much enthusiasm for the Sting as you should. And then <laughs> high and, and high and low. Another Kurosawa. 
And it oh, be, high and low. Yeah, I don't think it's on my. I'm list pretty sure I have that one on. I'm pretty sure I have that one on mine. So this is um, of all of these movies. This is the one that I'm the least familiar with. Okay, but that's not a because okay. I I've never seen being there. That doesn't mean I don't want to vote for it. You know, yeah. like I like. Uh, but do I do we need to do we need to swap something in that's going to work for community? <gasps> oh, or do we need to swap something in that's going to just be more like uh, mainstream? Do we want to keep it mainstream? Like we don't have to. I don't know that we need to do that. Yeah. Yeah. What are, what, what, I mean, we, we picked we picked. We picked Monty Python to fly in for Three Amigos yeah, because yeah. we wanted to, to leave that spot as a, we have, as a, we have comedy. a comedy. Oh, so what would be so the replacement like, for the bird? Well, My Cousin Vinny is My Cousin fun. Vinny yeah. is obviously That would be fitting, I think. Yeah. That's why I th- I'm, I'm leaning towards My Cousin Vinny. One, because I do like it, and I don't think it's on my list, but I like it a lot. And I think the vibes are very similar to the Burbs in yeah. that it's a cable movie. This is, this it's, is, it's this is funny. Cable. Uh, Marissa Tome. There's an Academy Award winner in here. Yeah, high pedigree. Yeah, I, I'm kind of leaning. Uh, although I, I, I can't really speak to being there. I, I, I would love to talk about my cousin Vinny. Clint. I mean, supposedly, supposedly, she didn't win the Academy Award. Jack Palance just read the wrong name. Um, that's the Is rumor, it, anyway. Yeah, I mean, my, here's my movement. my concern. Here's my concern with my cousin Vinny: okay. is we're gonna end up in the same spot as we did with the Burbs. I think it's a, I think it's super fun. I think it's super funny. I, I don't know that it's. I, I, I think you can make a case to boot it. Clint, Clint, Clint. There is a monster in this movie, so theoretically. So well, again, same boat as the Burbs. Do you think that? Do you think being there has a chance to stay on the list? Is my question because I don't know. Yes. I've never seen it. Let me. Ask I you. do. Okay. I love being there. I'm fine with right. you know what. Are, are I'm you fine. guys? I'm fine are you guys there. both? I could love it. I'm fine with being there. She's she, she, Let's I do being there. I, I would. Love I already love it. love it. Alex is willing to love it. I'm let's do to. being there. Let's do being there. Let's do being there, and let's do being there next week. Done. We'll talk about it right away. Can you make that? Talk decision? about talk about saving saving our agency and and our our control over our own lives. Let's do it that way. Um, I don't know. I feel like I've been on Cinefix way. longer than anybody else. So yeah, that's, hey, that's, that's my true. that's my choice. So you guys don't even get to decide. No. Um, all right. Well, being there, we're swapping in being there instead of the burbs, which feels feels right yeah. to me. I think that's a good decision. So with that one good decision that we made, uh, you got to have one every week. That's that's all you can hope for, really. But that's going to do it for us this week. Uh, thank you for watching the burbs with me, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, it was fun, even though we didn't like the movie quite so much. I do think it legitimately caused it. It spurred some interesting conversation. I know, that's and a, I want to hear like more I said, about. I enjoyed talking the about urban it legends that you I grew did. up with. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I enjoyed talking about the tangents more than I enjoyed yeah. talking about the movie. Yeah. Uh, so thank you guys for watching. Thank uh, thank everybody out there for watching this episode. Uh, thanks to our producer Tayo Yakin for keeping the lookout for us up on the roof. Uh, thanks to Marine Franzen for making all those weird noises in the basement and Jamie Parslow for running the cameras and also painting the house while his parents are out of town. Uh, Dan, I, you know, I'm going to thank catering for the sardines and pretzels before I thank you for anything. So that I think will wrap it up for us. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about being there. Peter Sellers, Hal Ashby. It's, it's going to be great. It's a good movie. I'm excited for you to watch it, uh, Alex. Me too. Uh, so in the meantime, stay safe, be good. We'll see you then.